Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today got a little odds and ends video to put together for you. Again, things are stacking up over here and need to work through these and get these taken care of, get a video published on this so that I can clear off my bench and get these items put up where I can start using them. Typically when uh, new items come into the shop uh, that I'm gonna share, I put them over here and I don't do anything with them until I shoot the video. And then once I shoot the video, I kind of put them up where they go and uh, have them available to start using in the shop. So things do literally pile up on me over there if I don't take care of this from time to time. So let's get in here. We got some viewer mail coming in. I got a, a new machine for the shop. I'm gonna share with you guys, pretty cool item uh, and, and just some general news about some stuff. So let's get at it. So up first here, got a little care package that came in from Scott Volage, and uh, Scott sent along a note, told me that uh, he enjoys the channel, uh, enjoys watching others such as A-Bomb79, Steve Summers, two good guys that I enjoy watching as well. And uh, he told me for 16 years he was a master plumber, pipe fitter, and boiler installer, and just enjoys learning about different things. Uh, he said about 20 years ago he started going to Living History events and uh, wanted to start accumulating some stuff. He learned how to make beef jerky so that he could do some trading for stuff. And he sent along some beef jerky, which I'm very anxious to tear into because I love beef jerky. And this stuff's been sitting over here for about a month now and I've been waiting to shoot this before I tear into them. But uh, he uh, told me that uh, he got into living history and one of the things he enjoys doing is the tomahawk throwing. And he sent along a very nice uh, tomahawk. I'm not sure if this is a handmade one or a commercial made one or what, but uh, nonetheless. And interesting, I've, I'm also into living history, have been for well, since the 1980s, I actually spent two summers working as a camp counselor out west doing living history type stuff. And during that time, I got pretty proficient at throwing a tomahawk. And I used to have a throwing tomahawk. I don't know whatever happened to that one. I have looked around for it. I think that my kids found it many years ago. And like when kids find things, they disappear. Uh, don't have any proof of that, but that's my suspicion. But uh, I'm very glad to have another throwing tomahawk, and I'm going to have to get out and set me up a place to start practicing again and see if I can do it. Uh, we actually go to a, uh, we have meetings for work at a plantation down in Florida, and they've got a place set up to throw tomahawks. So next time I go there, I'll, I'll look real professional and bring my own tomahawk with me. It won't have to use one of theirs. So anyway, some cool stuff here. Uh, Scott, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to enjoy playing with the tomahawk and uh, about to tear into this beef jerky and try it out. So on the beef jerky, he sent along two of them. One of them is marked hot and one is marked not hot. And in his note, he told me that one of them is marinated, marinated in teriyaki and Worcestershire sauce, the, and the hot is marinated in teriyaki and Frank's extra hot. We're just going to tear into this one. Let's see, this is uh, not hot. That just happened to be the first one I grabbed here. And uh, let's try it out. All right. Good. I'm going to wait, keep that one sealed up, try it later on. That's real good. Mm. Love beef turkey. Up next comes a pretty neat little collection of tools from Ray Brands down in Panama City Beach, Florida. And what Ray sent me were these punches here. And he calls these breakout punches. He says he's not sure the real name of them. And said if anybody knows, if they could leave a comment down in the uh, comments about it. But what he said these were used for, and he said he used these during his apprenticeship many years ago. But he says they're used, he said they used them for making uh, large openings in die shoes. And what they would do is drill a series of holes real close to one another and then use these punches to break the webs out between the holes and you could open up a big hole in something. Now if you look, these are made out of round uh, die stock. I'm sure that's a drill, drill rod. It's a certain diameter. The back side of this is kind of that diameter. Then you have this little area in here where the punch is. They can be ground and 
sharpened as they wear or whatever, but you would basically drop this down into the hole and then use the punch section in between to break out that little rib between two holes that were literally drilled just right next to one another. He said they had a special center punch that was adjustable and you could get the, 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 the holes just right where they were just right next to one another, just a little small rib in between them. Uh, he'd say he didn't have one of those center punches. I think I might have one over there. I have to look. I know that, that Starrett made a tool like that uh, for doing exactly this. Uh, but these little punches would then go in there and break out those little ribs in between the, 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 the two holes. And that would open up your hole in a large, uh, large piece there. So anyway, interesting. I've never used these before. Never. I, I don't have any. So this is something new to my shop. And uh, these are probably shop made, I'm guessing. Um, they look fairly, fairly easy to make. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to put these up and you never know, I might have a use for them one day. And if I do, I'm going to have me a nice set. Thanks to Ray. So Ray, thanks for sending these in. And, uh, I'll put them over here with my other, uh, punches and so forth. And I will have them if I ever need them. So next here, I got a really nice little care package in the mail from the guys over at blacksmithsupply.com. And uh, they contacted me a while back when I talked about we were going to be doing our work day on the um, steam engine out at the museum. And they wanted to contribute and help toward that project. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this because I know this is how it's going to work out because I've kind of got things planned. Uh, I'm filming this odds and ends actually before we go work on the steam engine. But because of the way I'm going to show the videos, the steam engine video is going to get posted before this one. So we are going to use these during the work weekend, but um, it's going to be shown after the work weekend. So just, just letting you know, because I know some folks are going to say, well, they did that already. Uh, but that's just kind of the way things work out. He told me, uh, you know, he was going to send along just some various tools and, and things we could use. And he sent along a bunch of pairs of gloves um, to help out with the day. And let's see, one, there was one set in here. These right here, these are really cool. Look at their Union Pacific gloves. Protect your hand, safety first. Uh, anyway, I just thought that was neat, Railroaded, railroaders gloves. He sent along some uh, safety glasses uh, in here. Let's see, there's, there's some little safety glasses, some earplugs. Um, but the big thing that he sent along was some of these consumables. So we got some wire wheels and uh, we're going to be using wire wheels to clean this up. So we got some cup wheels in here. Uh, these are some three inch twisted knot uh, cup wheels, cup brushes. These are awesome. And then also a couple of these larger ones. Uh, look at there. That's what a uh, four inch, five inch. I'm not sure, but uh, really nice cup brushes here. Brand spanking new stuff. We got a, just a wire brush there. It's got their blacksmith supply uh, logo on there. So anyway, I greatly appreciate sending this stuff along. We will use this stuff when we're out there uh, working on the steam engine, I am quite sure. And uh, between my shop and the museum, we use this kind of stuff all the time. So anything that doesn't get used, we'll put up and bet definitely use a later uh, date down the road. So thank you very much again. I greatly appreciate the guys over there. Go check out their website at blacksmithsupply.com. They have got a bunch of different tools in there. Uh, blacksmithing type tools that they sell. A lot of it's new stuff that's being made today. Anything from anvils and swages. I can't, I looked on their website a couple of weeks ago when this came in. A lot of blacksmithing related tools that they have um, available. So if you're into blacksmithing, check out these guys' website and uh, see what they have. They may have something you can use. And again, greatly appreciate it. We're gonna put this uh, stuff to work and uh, hopefully get that steam engine done. Like I said, you guys will have probably already seen that project when this video posts, but uh, that's just the magic of YouTube. Things don't always get posted in the order that the video shot. Next item here, we got uh, some new machinery tags that I had made uh, up for a Powermatic wood planer that I'm been kind of messing around with. I had my, my guy that helps me out 
stripped the paint off of it. I still do need to get it painted. It's not, I wouldn't really call it a restoration. We're just repainting it. I haven't even done any videos on it. It just needed a new paint job. But in the process, uh, some of the tags were kind of been messed up a little bit. Uh, wasn't, this one wasn't too bad. This one here, you can see it had been hit with some stuff, had some stuff missing on them. So I just had my buddy Tom Utley over at Vaughn Industrial make a new batch of tags for it so that we can put nice fresh tags on it. And uh, he was able to, I send him the originals. He was able to duplicate the artwork and uh, recreate new tags, uh, which is what he does. So uh, I always like showing these. He has done tags for me in the past. If you're really trying to do a high-end, top-notch restoration on something and you got tags that are just messed up and just don't look good, Tom does an excellent job of recreating those. And uh, he does all the artwork on the computer, uh, redesigns everything. He tries really hard to keep everything just as close to the original as possible. He'll, if you got the original that you can send him, he'll scan it. And then he has to digitize that, turn it into vector artwork. And uh, there's a process uh, of etching. Uh, depending on the tag, he either does a uh, acid batch etching or uh, in some cases he has a, a, a laser system that will make the tags. Uh, but either way, he can do a really good job for you. So I'd encourage you, if you got any tags that need to be made, reach out to Tom Utley at Vaughn Industrial. His website is vaughnindustrial.com. And uh, you can contact him through there. And uh, he always does a great job. I, I, once again, very impressed with his, uh, the job he did on these tags. Up next, got a really cool package here or a little instrument that was sent in by I'm gonna probably mess this name up but it's Francis Fouché who is from South Africa and he shipped this thing all the way to the United States from South Africa because he had seen in a video where I showed one of these before that I had borrowed from someone and said you know I'd love to have one he had one uh, and he wasn't using it, has actually uh, wanted to let me have it. So he sent this to me. So nice mahogany box. And what we got here is a Dumi McInnes uh, uh, Limited. This is a steam indicator. So let's open the box up here and kind of let you see what's inside. This is really, really cool. So let me kind of show you how this thing works best I can without actually hooking it up and doing it. First off, there's a little uh, fixture down here in the bottom of the box that this thing just kind of mounts to. Let me unscrew this and take it out. And there's a little piece here. This fits up into this and you plumb this into the steam engine itself. And let me kind of show you that. I've got a book here. And you can kind of see there's the indicator and they tap into both the top and bottom sides of the engine. You have to remember on a steam engine, uh, there's a piston in here, it's a disc and it goes back and forth and the steam pushes it in both directions. So it's different than a gasoline or you know regular diesel type engine. But you tap into the steam pressure on both sides of the cylinder and that is piped up into the bottom of the indicator here. And you got this little line and you take this over and actually put it onto the, uh, the, the piston or the, the connecting rod on the engine. So if you look here, you see the string is going over to the piston uh, like such. Hopefully you can see that. So you got a couple of things going on here. So number one, you got the steam pressure coming up from the bottom. There's a spring in here. There's actually some extra springs that are different strength depending on uh, what your engine's running. There's a chart up in here that kind of tells you which spring you need to use depending on the pressures. But uh, watch this right here. When this, uh, let's see, let me get it over here. Whenever, whenever this spring moves up and down, see the arm up here? It's moving that up and down as well. Now this is interesting because this is actually a pen or a pencil. It's a marking device and you have this cylinder here. Now you take a piece of paper, and there's some paper in here cut to the right size and you mount that on that cylinder, wrap it around that cylinder. And the cylinder is spring loaded. So when, whenever that piston moves back and forth, watch the cylinder, it moves through a cycle here. So you see there, it's, it's, as that piston is going in and out, 
it's moving this cylinder and that piece of paper. And at the same time, it's mapping the pressure on both ends of the steam engine, depending on, you know, where it is in that stroke. And what this does is it draws a diagram that shows how the uh, pressure is at different areas of the stroke. And from that, you can adjust your valves on your engine. Now, I've got a book here. It's all about steam engine indicators. And I'm going to show you some examples here of some of these uh, uh, charts that it'll draw. Let me find one here. So what you end up with is a diagram that's going to look something like this. And again, as your pressure changes, depending on where it is in relation to that stroke, you're going to get a nice diagram like this. And this is an ideal optimum diagram, but depending on how the valves are set, it may be offset one side or the other, but it gives you a visual indication as to, you know, how your valves are set and whether you're getting an optimum stroke. So it's basically a tool that an engineer would use to set up and adjust the valves on a steam engine to get the absolute optimum uh, efficiency out of it. I've got this book here. Uh, it's um, all about steam indicators. Let's see here, get that in the frame. It's all about steam indicators and it includes this particular one in here, but it tells you how to read these diagrams, how to diagnose uh, you know, problems, typical problems and, and typical things that you would see, how to adjust your, uh, your engine based on these different types of um, of um, uh, diagrams, there's a example showing, you know, where you got the compression, the discharge, the expansion of the steam in the cylinder. It basically shows on that stroke what it should absolutely look like. Well, anyway, there is just a real quick tutorial on what a steam indicator is, kind of how it's used. And, um, you know, it's just a cool item to me. And I would love to take a day, go out to the museum and set this thing up on one of our steam engines, just play around with it and see if we can use it to get our valves adjusted a little bit better, make it more efficient. Uh, it's just a really, really neat instrument. Uh, and thank you so much for sending this in. This is a treasure for me. This is something that, again, I've been looking to find one of these for a long time that's in this complete, that has all the parts and pieces in it and is not a, you know, it was just crazy money. And in this case, you know, uh, a viewer sent it to me. So that makes it, <laughs> makes it even better. I'm really proud to have this in my collection. And uh, again, would like to get out there and uh, try to use it and play around with it, see how it works. Maybe we can do a video on that one day. Up next from William Harmon in Sherwood, Oregon. He sent along some drill bits. These are mostly taper shank drill bits. So you got number one Morse tapers and number two Morse tapers on most of these. Got a couple of strength shake ones in here as well. That one there has got an odd taper on it. I don't know what that was. You know what, that was, I think that actually was made to go on a brace and bit and someone turned down a shank that they could use in a regular drill on there. But anyway, got some nice drill bits here. I've got a cabinet over there with my taper shank stuff. I'll go over there and what I may do is take these back there and put them on the drill sharpener first, put fresh uh, edges on all of them and then put them up in my cabinet so that uh, I'll have them when I need them. Uh, again, nice to have these. Uh, this one looks like it was for doing a counter bore. So you would drill a hole, pilot hole first and come back with the, this and this would be like to put a socket cap screw in. So anyway, nice little collection here. We'll, uh, we'll go through them, get them sharpened up, put them up and uh, they'll get used around here for sure. Next here comes some items from Paul Roberts up in Rico's Landing, Pennsylvania. Paul tells me he's a 70 year old retired coal miner. And he's got a little tinkering shop uh, where he plays around and stuff. He enjoys the channel and he had a couple of items that he said he'll never use that he picked up somewhere along the way. So this is a uh, interesting item. This is a 50 taper. This would like go up in my uh, milling machine, my big uh, horizontal milling machine. Uh, I imagine that this probably went into a dividing head originally. Um, it's made by Cincinnati Millicron. So Cincinnati, of course, made Cincinnati milling machines, very common uh, and very high quality milling machine manufacturer. Um, but what you got here is a center on one end. So this would be if you had returning parts between centers or milling a gear or something where you had a 
arbor where it was between centers. This whole contraption here um, is for putting your little drive dog that goes on there to drive it so that it will move it around. And it uh, looks like you had a slot in this and this piece here just kind of bolts on to the uh, center that's in, the, in there as well uh, to give you a little bit extra reach. So very nice little tool. I don't have one of these. I'm going to put these over in my 50 taper collection. And uh, this is something I'm sure that will come in handy at some time. This one looks like it's in excellent shape. Doesn't look like it's hardly ever even been used. Also sent along an involute cutter here. This is a um, four diametral pitch number two, uh, which is used to cut between 55 and 134 teeth. And uh, anyway, nice big uh, involute cutter. And I will put this with my other involute gear cutters. I don't know if I have a four pitch number two or not, but I do now if I don't. So uh, very nice to have. I'm always looking for these involute cutters to add to my collection. Because uh, like I have said many times before, it seems like every time I get ready to do a gear job, I don't have the cutter I need, even though I have hundreds of involute cutters. There's just so many possible sizes and uh, numbers of these. It's just nice to have a good selection of them. I uh, threw a couple other items in here. I have no clue what this would have been um, at all. This is a cam of some type. I'm not, who knows what it was actually made for, but somebody went to a lot of trouble. This very well may have been used on something like a, a screw machine. Uh, they use cams to uh, they have to make custom make cams to do a, to a, a specific job. So if you're not familiar, a screw machine uh, is a lathe. Uh, it's an automatic lathe, pre-CNC that you basically programmed by using things like these cams and stuff to do specific operations uh, on those machines. Really cool machines. And uh, there's actually still quite a few screw machines that are in use today because they are so dependable and you set them up for a specific job and just continue cranking that same part out over and over and over again. Uh, more or less obsolete in the world of CNC, but like I said, there's still quite a few of them out there being used uh, today. So Paul, uh, thank you very much for sending these in. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll put these up and have them when we need them. So up next, this is a really cool item that I'm really excited to have in the shop. And uh, this is actually a viewer gift, believe it or not, from Fred Widman up in the Chicago area. And Fred contacted me a while back, told me he had this uh, Porter Cable oscillating spindle sander, which ironically is a machine that I have always admired and just thought they were really cool and have just never picked one up for whatever reason. But he had this, it had been in his basement for a while. Uh, he got it from a friend of his who'd had it for a while before that. Uh, he's thinning things down and he wanted me to have it. He told me that he had seen my Porter Cable belt sander that I picked up a while back that I use all the time and I absolutely love that machine. And he said this just needed to go with it. Uh, and I tend to agree with him. I think that it is a very nice combination. So if you've never seen one of these, this is made by Porter Cable. Porter Cable, of course, is a brand of hand tools that many people are probably familiar with uh, today, although the stuff that Porter Cable makes in today's world well, I'm not going to say it's, it's, it's not good stuff, but it's not anything like what they made back in the day. I don't know the exact history, but I know that Porter Cable has been around for a very, very long time. I think going back to like the 1920s. Uh, and back in the 30s and 40s, they made some really nice heavy-duty stationary machines just like what you see right here. And just like my big uh, belt sander that I have back there in the back shop that I use all the time. And uh, very heavy duty, well-made machinery uh, that has stood the test of time. Now, this particular uh, oscillating spindle sander, I don't know the exact date on it. I haven't found a, a, uh, a serial number or whatever, but I'm very convinced it was made during World War II. And the reason is, I'm gonna bring you around here and show you, is this little badge on the side of the machine. So if you look over here on the side of the machine, kind of up underneath the table, it's got this really cool badge, War Finish, as directed by order L100, I think that's 100, maybe 108, uh, United States War Production Board. So during World War II, there was a huge need for machinery to make things for 
war production. And during not the World War, World war II, supplies and you know cast iron, brass, all the materials that were needed, it was in such tight demand that basically the only way that you could build a machine was if it was needed for war production. So to make the, the you know, tanks and airplanes and whatever, uh, armament, bullets, shell casings, anything that was needed for the war, that was a top priority. And they actually had a branch of the government that, you know, if you were like a company like Porter Cable, in order to be able to build a machine, you had to get approval from the War Production Board. It had to be an approved use that was needed for the war effort. And um, that is what this War Production Board was all about. War finish, what that basically means is, is that during the war, they cut some corners um, in the finish and fit of the machines. They didn't quite you know, do maybe the same level of, of finishing the machine up as they would during normal, normal times. And it might be just something as simple as, you know, look, we got a little bit of a rough piece right here from the casting. They didn't take the time to grind that out and really make it look nice because they were needing stuff done so quickly for the war effort that it didn't interfere with the production of the use of the machine. So uh, it wasn't important. It was get the machines made, get the stuff made for the war. It wasn't about being pretty. It wasn't about, you know, that same level that you would normally do. So if you see something like this says war finish on it, it basically said, all right, excuse the little imperfections in this thing. There's mechanically nothing wrong with it, but cosmetically it may not be up to our normal standards. So this is a very special machine in my books because this machine was built for the war effort. My, I, I don't know the history on it, but likely it went into an airplane factory um, or, you know, because, or something along those lines because during World War II, a lot of your airframes were made out of wood. Uh, or it could have gone into a boat factory making, uh, you know, Higgins boats or PT boats or something like that that were made out of wood. So there was a big demand for woodworking machinery. This machine would have fallen in that category. But there was a specific need for this in war production that allowed them to even be able to make it during that period of time. So pretty cool uh, a piece of equipment. In my opinion, this, this tool is a veteran and it helped win World War II. So I'm proud to have it in my shop. So you might ask, what is an oscillating spindle sander? So if you look, we got this spindle on here. It has a piece of sandpaper on it, a sanding drum can drop down on it. Um, it actually came with some other spindles and other diameters. Um, these are some real small ones. Uh, so there were different uh, spindles that you could just basically unscrew this piece and put it right back in there. Uh, and I don't know, I'm going to have to look and find a whole set. I've actually made some of these spindles before for other people that have the same machine. So they're, they're fairly easy to make if I don't have a full set of them. When you turn the machine on, notice that the spindle rotates and it moves up and down. That's the oscillating part. And you could come in here, if you had some scroll work or something that was a curve that you wanted to sand the side on, and it would do an excellent job of uh, sanding that right out. So this one is powered by one horsepower, uh, 220 volt single phase motor made by the Brown Brockemeyer Company out of Dayton, Ohio. And um, anyway, it comes in here and basically it's got a mechanism that turns it and moves it up and down. So I had some people comment when I posted some pictures on my Facebook page about the oval hole. Why is there an oval hole in the table? Well, there's a very good reason for that. And there's a little handle down here on the side. You can loosen this thing up. There's a little rack and pinion piece on here. And notice you can tilt the table all the way up to 45 degrees. And uh, that's the reason for the oval is when you are all the way angled up there, it has clearance all the way around. So really cool that you can uh, actually dial this thing in. There's a little uh, gauge down here in the bottom to get it leveled up. I don't know, I'm gonna have to check that and make sure it's calibrated properly. But once you get this thing where you want it, you just tighten it up and uh, you can set whatever angle you need on there. Well, there you go, a nice new addition to the shop. Fred, thank you very much, greatly appreciated. Um, 
Guys, I'm not going to do a restoration on this uh, because it has that war finish badge on the side. Uh, it, to me, it just deserves to be left alone. And it's in actually pretty good shape. It still has a fair amount of the original paint on there. I want to get this thing cleaned up a little bit better. But uh, I think we're just going to leave this old uh, war paint on here <laughs> and uh, not try to re erase that history. If, if it was in worse shape, I would probably consider restoring it. But uh, I think in this case, this one is, a, is good, good to leave alone. And I know I get a lot of people make comments about whether or not to restore an item, repaint an item. And for me, guys, uh, I like to see a, a nice fresh coat of paint on, on a piece of machinery. If you're gonna restore something, to me, a good paint job on it just kind of is the finishing touch. But at the same time, uh, if you've got a machine that's got decent, it's in decent shape like it is, it works fine. Uh, and when you get a machine like this one that has that war finish badge on there that probably says it didn't have a whole lot of paint and fancy stuff on it to begin with, to me, leave it alone. And this is a good case of one you just leave alone and you just use it. And uh, that's going to be my plan here as well. I often re hear these referred to as duck foot sanders because you got that kind of base down the bottom that kind of looks like a, a duck's foot. You know, the, the little um, flat feathered out foot on a duck. So anyway, nice little machine to have. And again, Fred, thank you very much uh, for thinking of me and passing this along. Fred made a trip down to Florida recently. No, I'm sorry, he went to Charleston, South Carolina for a wedding and uh, was kind enough to swing through here, visit my shop. Him and his wife stopped by, got to visit the shop and uh, delivered this to me on his way. He really wasn't really through the area, but he made a nice side trip over here uh, just to come by and see the shop and to uh, drop this off for me and I appreciate that as well. Well guys I think that is going to pretty much be a wrap on the odds and ends video. That's the new items that are coming to the shop. Before we get out of here though I, I want to just make a take a quick minute here and I, I do this periodically and I'm always feel a little bit awkward doing it but uh, it, it is it is necessary I think and that is to ask for your support uh, on the channel here. If you're a regular watcher of the channel and uh, you have the means and ability to do it, please consider uh, becoming a Patreon to the channel and kind of help support things around here. Uh, when you become a Patreon supporter, you basically are making a small donation to the channel on a monthly basis. And guys, I cannot tell you how much that really helps things out around here and really kind of helps keep things going. Uh, I've, I've said many times doing these videos, I enjoy doing them greatly, but it takes an awful lot of time, an awful lot of effort, and it really cuts into my production. Uh, it takes me at least twice as long to do any project out here when I decide to do it on video, probably three or four times as long when you take into consideration the time to do the editing and everything else. Uh, and, you know, it's not all about the money for me. I enjoy sharing with you guys. I enjoy showing you stuff and, and, and sharing my talents and my abilities with other people and uh, to help teach and preserve this craft. But at the same time, having that little bit of funding come in really does help kind of keep things going, helps buy new stuff that we need out here in the shop uh, and really kind of helps compensate for the loss of production that we get from making the videos. So. Um, give it a consideration. It, I, we're not asking for a whole lot. And, and when I say we, um, I, I, would, I would encourage you to do this for any of the YouTube creators that you watch on a regular basis. If you get value out of that channel, consider making a, a, a little bit of a donation, even if it's just a dollar a month. And a dollar a month may not sound like a bunch, but when you have lots of people doing it, it does add up and it does make a tremendous uh, impact on the ability to be able to keep on doing these videos and to justify being able to spend the time and put the effort in to doing it. So anyway, take that into consideration. There is a link for my Patreon uh, down in the uh, comments below in the video. Uh, there's a link on the homepage as well, um, etc. Click on it, help us out. If you don't like using Patreon, I also have a uh, a link for a PayPal page. You can either make a one-time donation there, or if you want to make uh, donations again on a regular basis, you can go do that through PayPal, very similar to how you do it through Patreon. But uh, again, I always feel awkward asking for that, but at the same time, guys, you know, think about if you get value out of this, make a little bit of a, a donation. It, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's free to you, but uh, 
it takes a lot of time and effort. And the compensation that we creators get from YouTube, uh, it seems like it's getting it's going down rather than up, uh, at least on a per video basis. So uh, any, any help out there is greatly appreciated. With that, guys, uh, that will be a wrap on the video. I hope you enjoyed seeing uh, some new things come into the shop and uh, get to see what's going on around here. And uh, with that, we're going to sign off. As always, thanks for watching. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, please hit that thumbs up. Uh, that tells you that you like the video. Uh, comments are appreciated. You can leave those down below. And uh, hit that bell icon as well. That will give you notifications when new videos are posted. Uh, when you hit the subscribe button, uh, it, YouTube doesn't automatically tell you when we post new things. But when you hit that bell icon, you're telling YouTube, hey, guys, I want to know when Keith Rucker or any other, any other uh, guy that you, you watch regularly when we post new videos so that you know it and you don't miss them. So with that, guys, we'll catch you on the next video. As always, thanks for watching.